My son helped me a great deal in putting together the Muscombe History Group channel. And this is a story that he requested, the story of management in the 20th century, its origins and development. This story is told in four parts, and part one charts the beginnings of management itself. Most people will have met, worked for, or have actually been a manager. Although I was a bit surprised in the 1970s when a group of high-flying ladies at one of my training sessions accused me of using a sexist word. The word has absolutely nothing to do with being a man, or a woman come to that. It is actually derived from Latin and on into French for being able to handle horses. Manipulation de chevaux. And by the 20th century, it had come to mean one who could manipulate a situation. This is a short history of how that was done. There is no doubt that the Industrial Revolution started in Britain. Our goods travelled around the world to service vast new markets. But what was the revolution? What and who did it affect? Initially, the industrial age started quite slowly. It was often driven by landowners finding valuable raw materials on or under their lands. Most important of these was coal, which powered the Industrial Revolution. And soon, enterprising engineers, chemists and industrialists began to change the shape of society and of human existence. As methods of transport got faster, people needed standard times and could not rely on the sun. Life began to be measured by the clock. Soon the industrial age took over the landscape. Families that for generations had worked on the land now found work in the factory or the workshop. And work that had been ruled by the sun became governed by the clock and the speed of the machine. A new breed of person arrived on the scene industrial workers. With them came new places to work and new working practices. Work was driven by the clock and the comptroller made sure people worked at the pace required. But machines meant people could work quicker they could produce more and earn more money in the factory than ever they had done on the land. But the comptroller's job soon gave way to a complex hierarchical structure that mirrored the great institutions of the age, the army and sometimes the church. A necessary pyramid structure with the owners at the top, who very rarely did anything to do with the work and passed this on to their agents, 
the agents then marshal the superintendents and the inspectors who were the people who ran the factories. As senior NCOs, the foreman in his bowler hat made sure that things ran smoothly and the tallyman could keep score of how much was produced, how much was wasted, how much needed to be done. The charge hands were the lance corporals of the age, working inside the groups of men, alongside them, but keeping everyone in check. And finally came the PBI, the workers themselves. Between the owners and the workers, the six levels became known as the management. The workforce was driven by time, and the overseers had the watches. And now began the problem, motivating the workforce to work. You can lead a horse to water, but can you make him drink? This is the story of how that was attempted in the 20th century, manipulating the horse. Frederick Winslow Taylor can reasonably be called the father of modern management. In 1911, he laid down his definition of scientific management. Under traditional proprietaries of initiative and incentive, practically the whole problem is up to the workman, while under the scientific management, fully one half of the problem is up to the management. The principal object of management should be to secure the maximum prosperity for the employer, coupled with the maximum prosperity for each employee. Scientific management is born. F. W. Taylor's methodology, as published in 1911, has clear steps. Firstly, each part of an individual's task is analysed scientifically. The most efficient method for undertaking the task is devised objectively, away from the working area to avoid distraction, and developed as the one best way of working. This consists of examining the tools and equipment needed to carry out the task and recording and measuring the maximum amount a first-class worker can do in a day and how it is done. Workers are then expected to do this much work every day. The individual is taught to do the job in the exact way devised. Everyone, according to Taylor, has the ability to be first class with at least one job. Management's role is to find out which job suits each employee and to train them to be first class. Managers must cooperate with workers to ensure the job is done in the scientific way. There is a clear division of work and responsibility between management and workers. Managers are concerned with planning and supervising the work. The workers carry it out. But let's just look at the first part of Taylor's scientific management routine. Each part of an individual's task is analysed scientifically. How on earth do we do that? Enter Frank Bunker Gilbreth. He came up with Thurbligs as a method of recording the work content in a task. 
a set of hieroglyphics which can be put together to picture a task. A simple modification can then be made from the study, which is to bring the tools to the bench, giving a much more efficient task. Thurbligs is Gilbreth, almost spelt backwards. But with 18 symbols, Thurblicks are complicated to use. Soon, the Gilbreths devise new and simpler symbols. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Bunker Gilbreth could show how well their organisation and methods worked by posing with their 11 children. Their techniques of symbolic logic became a Gilbreth family industry. So scientific management starts with Taylor and it starts with management activity and organization and methods which are laid down by management. The new symbols invented by Gilbreth were adopted by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and they became known as the ASME symbols. In fact, it wasn't long before members of the society forgot to use the bottom two and the five symbols left formed the basis of work study for the next five decades. Yes, that's 50 years. This meant that any task could be symbolically broken down into its activities with a brief description for each and times and distance added where appropriate. The process can be assisted by a pro forma layout for the study. Observations can be recorded with times and distances and the appropriate symbol can be marked. This document can then be taken away and studied at leisure to find a better way of doing the job. After her husband's death, Lillian Gilbreth became an international authority on process improvement and therefore worker motivation towards greater efficiency. And for a couple of decades, a band of F.W. Taylor disciples rushed to become experts in scientific management and devised ways of becoming industrial motivators by the study of time and motion in the workplace. It was led by Lillian Gilbreth and her sons. Henry Gant was also there, Elton Mayo, Anne Jones, James Whitworth, John Browning and many, many others. The academic disciplines propounded by these experts centred on work organisation and methods and focused on techniques of timed job evaluation, which would later become work study. Around 1910, Henry Lawrence Gant devised a pictorial method of showing multiple work tasks against a standard timeline. These were popularly known 
as a multiple activity chart. And the Gantt chart is still in use today as a computer planning image or a wall chart planner with coloured adhesive tapes. F.W. Taylor and F.B. Gilbreth were strong advocates of modern management. Together they would have formed an impressive team. But unfortunately they couldn't stand each other and every time they met a violent argument broke out. Fortunately Henry Gant became a go-between bringing the two men closer together. And the trio are beginning to influence some big industrial companies. Henry Ford is beginning to benefit from an assembly line approach and Ford's production line becomes an exemplar of production engineering. But Ford never accepted that his workforce had any rights other than what he allowed them. A war was already developing between management and workers. Manufacturing employers followed Ford's lead. They are making sure that scientific management is secured the maximum prosperity for the employer and the shareholders. But they tended to forget the bit about and maximum prosperity for each employee. The traditional methods of stimulating the workforce still tended to be the carrot and the stick, but with less and less attention being given to the rewarding carrot. Elton Mayo carries out a study that begins to define the situation so clearly that his findings are still quoted today. A study at the Hawthorne Telecoms factory in Cicero, USA. It was 1927 when he began to study at Hawthorne Telecoms factory in Cicero. The findings discovered something that became known as the Hawthorne effect. The study concluded that job satisfaction in the workforce was an elusive and extremely scarce commodity. Job dissatisfaction in the workplace was easy to find. Group output was restricted by the group's standard for output and this was respected by everyone in the group. The group was indifferent to the employer's financial incentive schemes. The group developed a code of behaviour based on their solidarity in opposition to the management. Output was determined by informal social groups. Output was not determined by the management in any circumstance. Dissatisfaction with work and with management seemed to be the natural state for workers in the new working environment. And the gap between management and the workforce is certainly a real divide and is beginning to grow. Inevitably, the workforce began to organise into unions. And soon they were voting to damage management's position by withdrawing their labour. 
organizing into trade unions and withdrawing their labor to damage the employer's prosperity leads to a new word in everyone's language. Strikes. Despite a dangerously wide gap opening between management and their workforce, Some bosses wanted to get back to a peaceful organisation made up of workforce and management. Organisation and methods being laid down by management and work measurement being closely studied has reached its limits. It looks as if something else is needed to get past the barriers. But what? Getting through the barriers is the story for part two. Don't forget to tick the like button if you enjoyed this program and subscribe if you want to keep an eye on what's happening at the Muscom History Group Channel. Goodbye for now.